Bonsoir à tous. Euh, merci, euh, Jean-Marie. Je, je te dis merci, mais euh, tu, tu m'as donné un problème en fait, parce que c'est euh, toujours assez difficile à te suivre en donnant euh, une, une conférence, mais je vais, euh, je vais essayer. Donc, je vais passer en anglais euh, maintenant, mais à la fin, si c'est plus euh, facile de poser des questions en français, je vais essayer de, de répondre euh, en anglais. OK. So, I'd like to begin by thanking my completely brilliant co-workers who did all of the work I'm going to talk about, and also uh, my deep thanks to the funding bodies who supported it. So please take a few seconds to think about the one material that you think is the most important has been the most important material for the development of our society as it is today. I'll give you my answer in a few seconds, but it'd be interesting if you could think about it. So, this is my answer. It is zeolite Y. Zeolite Y is the basis of the petrochemical industry that has dominated our society since the beginning of the 20th century. So every molecule of petrol passes through the pores of this material. Now, of course, the petrochemical industry has created a lot of issues as well as a, a lot of benefits. But the point I'm making is the tremendous impact of this one single material. So what about if we look to the future in, say, a hundred years' time? Which material will people identify as the critical material that showed us the way to transition beyond fossil resources? So I think this material will be lithium cobalt oxide. It's the cathode in the lithium ion battery. And it showed us for the very first time that we could practically use energy at very large scale that was not fossil energy. So if you look at zeolite Y, zeolite Y is a crystalline inorganic material. Lithium cobalt oxide is also a crystalline inorganic material. So perhaps, as a society, we should try to get better at finding crystalline inorganic materials, because just one crystalline inorganic material can change the world. And so the, the basic motivation for the research that my colleagues and I do is to find capability, new techniques, to accelerate the discovery of outperforming crystalline inorganic materials by supporting the work of experimental synthesis researchers realizing these new materials in the laboratory. The challenge is huge because you simply have to consider the very broad chemistry that the periodic table of the elements offers us for the synthesis of crystalline inorganic materials. We're all very familiar with the tremendous power of biology and biological chemistry in carrying out chemical transformations. But the complexity of the chemistry offered by the entire periodic table is even greater than that of biology. We have more elements, we have more modes of bonding, and we know much less about it. Because unlike biology, we haven't had a compound making machine running very, very fast since the beginning of, uh, of the Earth. So we have a more complicated problem, and we know much less about it. So, what would we like to be able to do to find materials like zeolite Y or like lithium cobalt oxide? Well, what we would like to be able to do would be able to choose the right chemistry, the chemical elements to combine to make the compounds, but not only the elements, but also their ratios, the chemical composition. So in the case of zeolite Y, you see here you have hydrogen and oxygen, this makes an acidic OH group. You take that acidic OH group 
you take this composition, but you arrange those atoms in exactly the right structure, okay, this is the structure of zeolite Y, it has pores, and those pores arrange the hydrocarbons such that those OH groups can take long chains and chemically convert them into small chains. So the composition and the structure together give us the function. That is what we need to be able to do to find next generation functional inorganic materials. And to do that, we have to make a set of choices about which experiments we do. Because, in fact, synthetic chemistry in the laboratory is complicated. You may choose a target, but there are so many different ways you could try and realize that material. So it will be tremendously helpful to make those choices correctly in the first place. We've seen we need to choose combinations of elements, we need to choose compositions, but in particular we must be able to synthesize those materials in order to define the structures that together with the composition give us the properties that we are seeking. So how do we make those choices? And we make those choices based on the understanding that we have. And the understanding arises from the knowledge that we have generated by exploring the inorganic solid state chemistry of the periodic table. And we do that for a variety of reasons, some of which are purely driven by improving functions that we already have. But as a chemist, one of the main drivers for exploration of the space is to increase our understanding of what happens when we change the nature of the chemistry question we are asking. So here, here is an example. If you look in the database of known compounds, like the inorganic crystal structure database, you'll see there are lots and lots of compounds where you have one anion, like oxygen, and many cations. So this very important compound, yttrium copper oxide, the first above liquid nitrogen temperature superconductor, this is an example of a sort of compound we know a lot about. One anion and many different cations. But if you invert the question and say, well, what about materials that have just one cation but three anions? There are far fewer of those materials. And that's a question that we've been interested in over the past few years, trying to generate more examples of such compounds. And here is you know, very simple thinking that we used. We identified some single cation, two anion compounds. Here are two examples. And then we said we would look for compounds at the intersection of those chemistries. So one bismuth and three anions. And we explored the chemistry and we identified a material with this crystal structure. And you see, if you now focus on the bonding of the three different anions there, very often we look at the chemistry of compounds from the coordination of the cations, but here we're looking at the coordination of the anions. Each one of those anions plays a different role in the crystal structure. So here's the oxygen arranging four bismuths. Here's a chlorine. It's terminally bonded, so there's only bonding on one side of it. There's no bond here, so you have this sort of van der Waals gap. But the selenium is not terminally bonding, it's bridging, it bridges the cations. So when you put them together, you've got this alternation of strong and weak bonds throughout the structure. But also, if you look at the environment the selenium is placed in by the combination of all that new chemistry, let's look at the distance between the bismuth and the selenium. So in the binary bismuth selenide, this distance is just over three angstroms. Well, here, it's really a lot bigger. It's 10% bigger. So the actual bonding at that bismuth has really been changed. And so by generating, by addressing this question, you know, one cation, three anion, generated new combinations of chemistry, changed the bonding, and as a result, it turns out that we changed the properties. So here is the thermal conductivity of the material, bismuth oxide selenide chloride, this material. And you can see it is lower 
than the thermal conductivity of any previously reported crystalline inorganic material. In fact, it's only four times the thermal conductivity of air itself. It turns out that's because the bonding means that heat moves through the material very slowly. The vibrations that transfer the heat both move very slowly because of that alternation of strong and weak bonds from the bridging and terminal anions. And also those vibrations are scattered once they move very rapidly because of the, the unusual bonding environment that the bismuth is, is placed in by the arrangement of the seleniums. So that combination of chemistry in our new compound, driven by exploring a basically chemical question, has resulted in a new record functional property. And thermal conductivity is an important thing. We need to be able to understand how to control it for a range of applications. For example, thermoelectric uh, waste heat harvesting, also thermal barrier coatings for uh, jet engines. It's very important to me today, or indeed if you, any of you fly on an aircraft, the jet, when it's operating, is the, you know, the gases are actually at a temperature above the melting point of the turbine blade. And it's only because you have a very low thermal conductivity material in the way that the whole thing uh, works. So when we make choices and we find new materials, we can generate new properties. But I said at the beginning, actually, we have relatively few examples given the potential size of the space compared, for example, to uh, biology. And really, if you look at the question of how, we, how are we going to find new compounds from all of this chemical space, you can divide it into two parts. How do you choose the elements that you're going to combine? And then having chosen them, which particular compositions are you going to target for synthesis? If you can answer both of those questions, you will increase your uh, probability of finding new materials. You will make your discovery process uh, more efficient. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to address Jean-Marie's question because I'm going to talk about the discovery of a new solid electrolyte material. I'm going to show you how some of the tools that we've been developing helped us in realizing that material. And I'm also going to show you how that material may change the way that we think about how ions move rapidly in solids. So one of the things people quite reasonably say when you're confronted with a big space, they say, well, let's, let's use a robot. You know, we can make lots of things with robots. We can explore lots of combinations. And it is a very powerful tool to explore a well-defined question. So if you understand a lot of things and you say, yes, I want to look at this particular piece of chemistry, it involves exploring this, these different variables, you can really efficiently explore the space. So here is an example of a catalyst discovery for the Fischer-Tropsch reaction, just taking carbon dioxide and transforming it into uh, fuels and, and chemicals. And we were able to evaluate a very large number of materials and identify a catalyst that is both stable and active uh, for that reaction, which we were then able to patent with our industrial partners. We've also recently used this to synthesize new complex oxide materials, for example, extending the range of solid solution of this uh, candidate proton uh, conductor here. But Given the size of the space, you always have to have a question. You can't just go wandering around in this chemical space with a robot and hope to hit something because of the size of the space. So even with robotic tools, you need to have hypotheses and you need to have well-defined questions that those tools can help you answer. And the question I'm going to talk about today is how do we find new structures that support fast motion of ions in solids. 
I'm going to look at some of the state-of-the-art materials for uh, lithium ion transport. Perhaps uh, Jean-Marie's been talking about those. And the understanding of how it arises. Why is it that those structures and compositions produce fast iron motion? Well, there are two overarching ideas, one of which is that you have to have one of a relatively restricted type of anion packings, because those anion packings can define pathways for motions of the lithium, where the lithium is able to move through many sites, but all of those sites have very similar coordination chemistry. So, for example, in, in these BCC-like cases, and also in this um, tetrahedrally close pack case, the ions are essentially moving through different sites that are all uh, tetrahedrally coordinated. So you want an anion packing that allows the lithium to move through sites where the coordination, where, where the coordination number is essentially the same. So what we tend to have are relatively high symmetry structures where disorder generates many sites, but they're all crystallographically the same or very, very uh, close in uh, coordination. And this, in turn, has restricted our attention to a relatively small number of anion packings. If we look at those packings, it turns out they're closely related to the packings shown by a completely different class of compounds, the intermetallics. So intermetallics have metallic bonding. They don't have ionic bonding like these uh, materials. But if you look at the packing of the anion, say in argyridite, it's the same as the packing in uh, this lavis phase, magnesium copper 2, or in LGPS, it's the same as the packing in copper arsenide. You can do the same with LLZO, uh, etc. So these special anion nets that allow ions to move without much change in their coordination environment come from the chemistry of intermetallic compounds. But actually, intermetallic compounds have the most diverse range of crystal structures of any class of compounds, certainly much more diverse than those of uh, ionic materials. And by restricting ourselves to the small set that will support this sort of high symmetry, many sites, very similar coordination chemistry idea, we're ruling out really a lot. Okay, so here's an example. Here's a material. Titanium twice nickel, it's an intermetallic, and it's actually able to take up rapidly a large amount of hydrogen to make a hydride. And the hydrogen sits in the interstitial spaces formed by the metals. So the metals here, titanium is in yellow and the nickel is in purple, and the hydrogen sits on these blue and, and green sites here. So what if we broaden our definition of an acceptable anion framework. When we look at an anion framework, from, we, we say we want to find anion frameworks based on intermetallics that transport hydrogen. And these have many interstitial site types, not solely sites that have very similar coordination. There's much more diversity there. So, you could imagine doing the following. So you might say, well, it's an intermetallic, so let's have two metals. Well, let's choose two anions, one for each. And then if we take the interstitial sites, we can obviously put lithium there, but we'd also like a framework forming element, because that will give the structure some stability to allow the lithiums to go and it's sort of storming through it. So what we want to do is find those new compounds that allow us to make this structural connection to the structure of, of intermetallic compounds. So we want to choose this set of elements, this set of four elements from the periodic table. Well, you can only need to choose three. There's actually a lot of choices, but of course we know things Jean-Marie has been telling you about things that make an acceptable solid electrolyte. So these are probably the elements we would 
restrict ourselves to, and there are 296 of these combinations of chemistry. And surprisingly, most of them, actually hardly any of them when we started this work, have no reported compounds in them. Kind of surprising, and it tells you how little we've explored chemical space. But which one should we study? Because even if we choose one, there's so many different ways to carry out the reaction chemistry. We could be at it really a long time. So it would be good to choose the ones where new compounds are most likely to form. And this is where uh, we use statistical learning from data, or machine learning. So we're very fortunate in inorganic materials chemistry that we have, have extremely well curated sources of information, such as the inorganic crystal structure database, which contains the compositions, many, many crystalline inorganic materials. And what we can do is take this information about element combinations that really result in the formation of compounds and build a machine learning model called a variation, variational autoencoder that learns what a set of elements that actually form compounds looks like. And what it does is it takes some characteristics of those elements we call features and connects the formation of a compound from the combination of those elements to their individual features. You simply, it's essentially an exercise in very large scale regression fitting to connect elemental features to the data that you have. And we would train our machine learning model to minimize the difference between the compositions that we know are present in ICSD and the compositions that the model would uh, predict to be stable. And then when we have our question, which of these different element combinations should we study to find new compounds, we can show that question to the model. So here, it's just telling us what we already know, that's training the model. Right? So here we have a question about where to look for those new compounds. And we give the model that question and say, which would be best? And it says, this one would be best, lithium, silicon, sulfur, chlorine. And it ranks all of the other ones as well. And that's useful because that's based on statistical assessment of thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of data points. I don't know about you, I can't hold all those things in my mind when I think about something. But equally, that model doesn't know anything about chemistry or structure or anything. It knows about what it's learned by connecting the features to the known compounds. So these are completely, if you like, orthogonal ways of looking at the world. And we have the op opportunity to support our insight with that information. And for me, that's a very important point. I'm advocating that we support our insight and we do not replace our insight. So anyway, here we have our variational autoencoder based on the ICSD. We ask it this question and it says lithium, silicon, sulfur and chlorine. And we looked at that and we said, hold on, what are we trying to do here? We're trying to make a material where the anion structure is based on an intermetallic with two different anion sites. Well, lithium, silicon, sulfur, and chlorine is not really going to help us, probably, because sulfur, sulfide and chloride are almost the same size. So we took what the statistical learning model said, and we said, yeah, but we know about crystal chemistry, we know about size, we know about bonding. Choosing that is not going to help us answer our question. What about if we looked at sulfur and iodine? Well, these are much more different in size and much more likely to occupy different sites in the crystal structure. And it turns out that's rated ninth out of 296. It's still pretty high. And that's what we did to choose the combination of elements that we were going to study. So that's the how to choose question. And that's how we use statistical learning, machine learning, to help us address that question. The next question 
is the one I called where to look, well, we take those elements and we say, well, which compositions should we be targeting in our experimental synthesis? And here I'm going to step out of looking at ionic conductivity and talk to you about some tools that we have developed to allow us to focus within a chemical space on a particular range of compositions. It's called probe structure-based discovery. And the idea is you use crystal structure prediction tools. I'll say a little bit more about these tools in a moment. Um, they essentially give you the lowest energy or an estimate of the lowest energy for a given composition. So you can calculate that energy across all of the compositions within, a, within an, uh, a chemistry that you have selected and compare the energies of these new compositions to the energies of the known compounds made from those elements. And then if you have a, a new composition that gives you a very low energy, this will allow you to say, yeah, that, that composition is actually going to be competitive with the known compounds. That's a good place to look. So here, this is the energy versus known compounds, called the convex hull. Black is good. So this is actually a five element example. This is a ternary section. You can see here is a good place to go and make compounds. And uh, Chris Collins, having done the crystal structure prediction, also went into the lab and made two new compounds that have structures that are not in the database. Okay, so this is not the same as taking something that has the sodium chloride structure and making something else that has the sodium chloride structure. This is looking for new structures that are different from the structures that we uh, already have and generating them with this probe structure technique that's based on crystal structure prediction. And we've since shown that you can combine that compositional targeting with targeting for properties based again on machine learning. So here, here's the stability calculation together with a cal calculation of uh, thermal conductivity using a machine learning model that targeted a particular composition range, again allowed us to make a unique structure. This material actually is the first example of a bulk inorganic quasi-crystal and that material had an extremely low thermal conductivity uh, compared to benchmark oxide materials. So this probe structure prediction is very effective for targeting composition areas for synthetic exploration, even in high dimensional compositional spaces. And we can effectively use it together with statistical learning models. Now, before I go back to lithium ion conductors, it won't be long, don't worry, I'm going to finish by saying something else about crystal structure prediction which is important because we're using crystal structure prediction to work out which, rain, which exact part of that chemical space to target in the laboratory. Now, all of the crystal structure prediction methods in use at the moment are what are called heuristic methods. What I mean by that is, if you imagine these contours here are the energy of a particular composition and the axes here are you know, where, the, where the atoms are in space. What a heuristic does is it wanders around that potential energy surface in a very clever and informed way, generating structures, calculating their energies, comparing them with the previous ones, make more structures until your compute budget runs out, and then you get an estimate of the lowest energy possible of that composition. It's very important that that estimate is as good as possible because we're using it to compute whether a composition is going to be competitive in energy with known compounds and therefore make a new material or it's not. So it's really important that we have the best estimate possible for the crystal structure of any composition. And these heuristic methods, because they walk around the space and don't consider all of it, will never give you a guarantee of finding the lowest energy. So last year, working with colleagues of Vladimir Gusev and colleagues in uh, computer science in Liverpool, we were able for the first time to offer guarantees about finding the lowest energy of a crystal structure given only the composition. And we did it by combining this 
continuous optimization. You wander around the space, you stop somewhere, this is a global search for the whole space, you stop somewhere, you do a local optimization, you get an energy, on you go. We combine that with discrete optimization. So we put a grid over the space and we find the best possible allocation of atoms in the composition to that grid of points. So you've taken your structure prediction from a continuous space where the atoms can go anywhere to a grid of points and said, what is the best possible configuration of atoms on that grid? And it turns out you can answer that question exactly using a, a technique called integer programming. And so you can identify exactly the lowest energy configuration on the grid. And if the grid has the correct spacing, with just one subsequent local optimization, not tens of thousands as we would do in a heuristic search, with just one subsequent local optimization, you can go from the lowest energy configuration on the grid to the lowest energy structure in the continuous space. So from a position where we're relying on these estimates, in the future, we may be able to exactly describe the energy for any composition, particularly as this formulation of the crystal structure prediction program is uh, perfectly set up for deployment on uh, quantum computers, which can address the combinatorial explosion, which is, what, uh, threat, which is the big problem that all crystal structure prediction faces. Let's go back to our lithium, silicon, sulfur, iodine chemical space and using crystal structure prediction to answer this where to look question. So Andrei Vasilenko, who also built the machine learning uh, variational autoencoder that I was telling you about earlier. Andrei uh, ran the energy assessment by crystal structure prediction over that space and identified this region around this composition is particularly promising for synthesis. So just to remind you, we've chosen our chemistry. We've run crystal structure prediction to target the identification of composition, carry out synthesis, and we experimentally isolate this new lithi lithium silicon sulfur iodine compound. We can determine its structure in the lab, we determine its composition. So it is a discovery, it's not a prediction. It's a discovery of a material. And if we look at the structure, so here's, here are the sulfurs, here are the iodines. We've got a network of anions, and we've got lots and lots of different cation sites. How's that ar arisen? Well, we were talking at the beginning about getting anion nets of different sorts, and we wanted intermetallic related nets. So here is our net of sulfurs and iodines. It's squares and triangles. It's a semi-regular net. It's actually found in nickel zirconium, which is an alloy that forms a lot of hydrides, actually. This net, each sphere is connected to five others, is related to close packing. If you take this layer of triangles in close packing and sort of shear it, like this, you turn it into triangles and squares like this. So this is a net that's related to a close pack layer, but it's not quite a close packed layer. It's found in nickel zirconium. And here we have the sulfur and the iodines ordering. So you have rows of pure sulfur and rows of mixed sulfur and iodine. And then you take those layers and you stack them. And actually the way they stack is Quite interesting, I think, because I like structures. You stack the triangles on the triangles, and you stack the squares on the squares, with the iodines as close together as possible when you stack the squares. And then if you look at that, down this direction, it's, it's a combination of hexagonal close packing, viewed down you know, stack, ABA stacking axis, <coughs> and cubic close packing, but viewed down the cube axis. So you've sort of combined these two uh, close packing motifs by having these alternating rows of uh, pure sulfur where the sulfur is five coordinate in the plane it's got two triangles either side so it's 11 coordinate 
And these 13 coordinate rows containing the iodine, where you've got two squares either side. So the average coordination number is 12, like in a close packing, but it's 13 and 11. So we have a structure that's a combination of hexagonal close packing and a sheared version of FCC, and it has a tremendous number of potential interstitial sites in it. And actually, a lot of them are occupied. 15 different crystallographic sites occupied by lithium, different sites very large, low symmetry structure. And that occupation of those sites is directed by the silicon, which is silicon 4 plus, very small, very covalent. It sits in the smallest tetrahedral sites, surrounded only by the smaller sulfides. It wants to be as far away from the iodines as possible. You put the highly charged silicon there and the large iodines here, you can then rationalize why these 15 sites are occupied by lithium. Lots of different sites. Surely that'll mean the lithium just gets sort of stuck somewhere. This is the idea, right? There's lots of different sites. It won't be very good for moving lithiums around because they're all different. So it'll be a very bad lithium ion conductor. But actually, no, the first example of doing this is a material that at room temperature is 10 to the minus 2. There's not many families that uh, do that. Okay, there's Compounds where lots of variants have been made, but not many structural families that will do that. You drop the temperature, and here's a fragment of the structure. Actually, interesting, just, just below room temperature, the conductivity uh, declines quite a lot. And what happens at that point is some of these many sites actually become unoccupied, breaking the connection. So actually having fewer sites is worse in this, in this case, not, not better. But this is the point. We get this very high conductivity from multiple distinct sites. It's confirmed by NMR. The NMR actually, this is from uh, Fred, Fred, uh, Fred, Fred Blanc's team, the NMR uh, actually, because of the frequency dependence of the spin lattice relaxation time, shows you that lithium transport is three dimensional. That's also confirmed by Avenitio molecular dynamics calculations that shows the lithiums really sort of storming through this very, very complicated structure with 15 different occupied lithium sites. Now, my colleagues, Dmitry Antipov, Chris Collins, Matthew Dyer, and George Darling did a tremendous piece of work on picking and understanding this pathway, which has 162 different site-to-site -site hoppings in it, not four. Right? But despite all these different connections, Conductivity remains so high. So here's a representation where these green bars, they're thicker, the faster it is for the lithiums to move between the sites. So what we see is two regions marked one and two with these orange things here where the lithiums are really moving fast. And then many connections between those regions, despite the fact that all the sites are different. There's just no trapping. So you can actually see there's a hierarchy within the potential energy landscape that the lithium sees. So here, we see there are 11 connections between eight sites, one of which is actually unoccupied in the, in the uh, original structure. There are 11 connections between eight sites that have a very low barrier. Then between those, there are 18 connections that still have really a, a, a low barrier. It's not tremendously low, but it's low. So although there are lots of different sites, there are lots of different low barrier pathways between them. Because it's not just the number of sites. The anions, because there are different anions arranged in different coordination geometries, are able to connect those different sites by low barrier pathways. Because the bonding chemistry to the anions is able to lower the barrier throughout this very complex network. And it means there's always some path for the lithium to take. It doesn't get stuck. So you don't need a small high symmetry unit cell. You can have a low symmetry cell with lots of different sites and get very high conductivities. So the site diversity can create many different low barrier connections. There's really no need to restrict ourselves only to those nets that minimize the cation coordination change. 
because this chemical bonding, it's the power of chemical bonding coming from diverse combinations of chemical elements, in this case the anions, is able to lower the barriers and allow those lithiums to move through this net, which really doesn't fit uh, our idea of what should be giving fast transport. Now, of course, that idea has been tremendously powerful. There's nothing wrong with it. All I'm saying here is we don't need to be restricted in this way. We can think of much broader chemical space, much broader composition and structured space to find high mobility, not least because of the tremendous diversity within the structural chemistry of intermetallics. So to recap, we looked at what it meant to design zeolite Y. We have a load of choices. We can support those choices with machine learning, crystal structure prediction, leading to experimental synthesis. But the, that synthesis, those experiments were selected by the expert researchers in inorganic material synthesis. They thought about what was coming out from the computational tools and were able to use it in support of their decisions. And then that leads to experimentally measured uh, properties, which has shed hopefully some new light on how structure leads to fast iron transport in solids. Now you may say, oh well okay, you can do this kind of chemistry and structure piece. Can't you also predict the properties as well? Well, uh, we didn't do that here, but you might be able to. So last year we published a, a machine learning model based on a database of lithium solid electrolyte uh, conductivities. Actually, Arno was involved in putting this database together. And there's a machine learning model, which can, again, based purely on the composition, will allow you to predict the lithium ion uh, uh, conductivity. And actually, it predicts that this composition has a very high conductivity. So maybe in the future, we'll be able to get even more support from these uh, machine learning models. But ultimately, it's going to be synthesis in the laboratory by exploring new chemistry of the elements that is going to give us the materials that we need. And I hope I've shown you that given the vast scale of this space, we really don't know a lot. But we've got more knowledge and understanding, we've got these new tools, and I think there's you know, great hope for the future of finding the materials uh, that we will need. So thank you very much for your attention.